Hi there. I'm John Michael Garropy, and this is Popcorn Roulette. Each episode, I ask a guest to join me on the show. They suggest a movie, and I go watch it, and we talk about it. For today's episode, I have my friend with me, Tom Lackalade. Tom, what's something you do? Well, um, I have two children. Okay. And I really love to play tabletop games. And for work, I'm the IT manager for a car dealership. Nice. Uh, now, I asked you when you came over uh, what uh, what uh, theater food you'd like to actually have us uh, eat today. Um, what, and you chose uh, bottle caps. Absolutely my favorite. Uh, these things taste like sweet tarts for the most part. Why do you like these favorite. bottle cats, the caps? I don't know. It's just uh, it's the type of thing that uh, pretty much like every movie I've ever gone to, uh, I've had some of these. And uh, you know, it's kind of like soda flavored. And mm. I don't think you're supposed to eat that many at the same time. These things used to be much larger, actually. Um, like quarter size, right? I'm trying to figure this out. You know, I had to run around to uh, two grocery stores, three convenience stores, and eventually found these stupid things at Walmart. It took me forever to actually get my hands on them. They are awesome, though. Mm. I grabbed too many. <laughs> <laughs> Today's movie we're talking about Fight Club with uh, Edward Norton, Brad Pitt, and Helena Bonham Carter, directed by David Fincher. Why do you uh, want to talk about Fight Club? You know, I think Fight Club really was just an, an awesome movie. And the particular thing about Fight Club was I thought there was a lot of replayability in it. And that might seem strange at first because it's your, you know, it's like almost like a typical like setup with a crazy twist at the end. But the way they designed this film, I just saw so, watching it a second, uh, multiple times after that, there's just so many details that you can pick up after you understand what's going on. It just really, really definitely. Took me. You mentioned Fight Club to me, and my first response was like, "Oh no, we're talking about Fight Club," because it got over talked about. Like back no. when it was first released in 1999, everybody wanted to. Talk. Well, to be precise, it bombed in the movie theaters at first, but then it became a cult classic very fast, and everybody wanted to talk about like this movie they watched and all the stuff that was around with them. But it's been 17 years. Fight Club has kind of gone out of the public consciousness by now, and it's easy to take a look at it from like a reverse perspective and be like, what was that movie? What the heck was going on? Why was everybody so excited about this thing? Um, do you remember like the first time you ended up watching it out of curiosity? Yeah. You know, what we should do first, we should talk about, explain to people what Fight Club is, because um, they may not know the premise of the movie. You don't have to actually go and watch the movie if you, if you want to listen in, and we'll just give you a, a quick rundown if you want to. Just go check out Fight Club. We're on the internet. You can go find us um, at HavelCommunityTV.org, or you can find us on, on YouTube as well. Um, why don't you break down the plot first? By the way, we're totally going to spoil Fight Club. Uh, we're, uh, this, <laughs> the, we're not going to dance more. around this. This is a terrible idea to try to like pretend that we don't know the twist. We aren't going to talk about the twist because we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the movie. It's almost impossible. You've had 17 years to figure out whether or not uh, you wanted to watch this movie or not. So now it's going to be spoiled for you. But what, what, what's, how does Fight Club work? I can, I can do a rundown of that. Yeah. So the movie opens up with uh, the narrator on top of, uh, you know, in, in this uh, almost like a maybe abandoned building with a gun in his mouth. And he starts telling the story about how Tyler Durden came into his life. Yeah. And so the whole movie is narrated um, by the main character and told almost like a flashback. Yeah. So uh, you learn about this, this character and... and his name, as far as I know, is, is never actually used. He's called the narrator. Uh, sure. Websites tend to call him Jack oftentimes, just for a lack of a better word yeah, for him. Yeah, there's certainly a couple scenes that uh, Evidently, sense. the uh, the, um, the subtitles give him the name Rupert, which I think was one of the fake names he well, gave. Well, yeah, he had, he had several different names. But it yeah, causes like, some confusion as to what people actually want to call him. But yeah. like, we can call him Jack if you want to. That works well. Yeah. Um, well, so you know, it, it, it starts off, you know, from there it shows how he just has insomnia. He can't sleep, he's not sure if he's really ever awake or asleep, and as the movie progresses, you start to kind of understand some of these details, but it follows him eventually conquering his insomnia by joining support groups that he had absolutely no business being in. Yeah. Um, and he finds that being near people that uh, you know are just so upset, he can, he can cry, he can release in that, 
and he just takes advantage of those. Give him a chance to release and grieve for something he doesn't understand what he's grieving for. Yeah. So, you know, it, 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 it kind of cuts through there. As he goes through these support groups, he eventually keeps matching up with another woman who we've, he determines is just doing the same thing as him, and that ruins all of the uh, release that he gets from these groups. And he can't, he says he can't do it with another, what was it, did he say? Um, he calls her, I, I know he thinks tourist. of her as a phony, a tourist, tourist. right. That's the, that's the term he uses. And uh, so he works with her to say, all right, you know what, let's, let's split these up. I never want to see you again. Yeah. And so you, as this develops, you start to learn a little bit more about the narrator. He works uh, for a car company as an insurance adjuster, and he's got really like a horrific job. He looks at total car accidents where people are killed, and he tries to figure out if it's just cheaper to pay off lawsuits than it is to do a recall and save people's lives, which is really just so for the most so part, crazy. he absolutely hates both what he's doing and the style of life he leads. He also like, complains about the type of Ikea furniture that he's been filling his life with. He has absolutely nobody else in his life. Comes across Tyler in an aer airplane. Exactly. So uh, in this traveling, he meets Tyler in an airplane. He makes some, some clever jokes there. And, and uh, Tyler Dern is, is quick to really just, you know, shoot him down and, you know, Tyler is all almost kind of like all these things that he wants to be. The narrator finds him really interesting. And, you know, so he's, he's really like, you know, he thinks this guy is great. He calls him his best single serving friend. That's his little yeah, quip yeah. that he's got there. So, so after, that, after that plane lands, he's heading home and he gets to discover that his apartment completely exploded. Everything he owns is on the street, including his favorite yin yang table and everything. And, <laughs> and he's just. I mean, he, he's visibly just destroyed because for him, he had no life. His furniture was somehow his, his life and he doesn't know where to turn. He doesn't know place. So for some reason, and he tells it like he just doesn't even know why he did it, but he calls his friend Tyler Durden. I know, this is really kind of funny. He calls him because he's the only person he knows. <laughs> it's pretty Which is, obvious at the same time. I don't know why I did this. If he had, you have his business card, there's no other option, so he calls Tyler. Right. At, least, at least in his mind, this is what you're, you know, what, how, how he's narrating it. Right. Um, he goes to the bar with, with, with Tyler. They have drinks, and you know, they're just having a good time. Outside the bar, he's like, oh, I guess I gotta get a hotel. And Tyler's just flipping out on him, you know, just just ask me, this is why you invited me here, right? And Nader has such a hard time doing it. So eventually he says, hey, can I stay with you? Tyler's like, sure. And as they're walking away, that's like the, and the you know, the, where everything kind of starts up here right. is Tyler's like, I want you to do me one favor, just hit me. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of like, oh, I can't do that. And they just, they just start brawling. Which, by the way, that, that punch that... Uh that the narrator gives Tyler, um, like the director actually told Edward at the last moment to like actually hit him as hard as you could. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so that reaction that. From, from Brad Pitt is as authentic as they get. His like shock and his like, I'm like, that's terrible. And then like, that's awesome at the same exact time. is like straight up Brad Pitt. Yeah, everything about that scene really just came together so amazingly. Yeah. So. He finds out Tyler lives in some old dilapidated house. He thinks maybe he's a squad or something like that. Just the most rundown building, floods in from the from the roof and the basement. Electricity barely works. To really befriend him, and he finds that this the fighting gives him so much more like stability, and somehow that release just just fighting with people for no reason, just really like enlightens him, opens up his life. Uh, and they really just start building a network of these underground fight clubs. It just starts to just keep, you know, they just have fights in a parking lot and more and more people get together. There's a lot of little scenes, but the end result is it spills into Project Mayhem, right. where like Fight Club starts off as being about a bunch of guys beating each other up in the basement of a bar. It eventually ends up leading to uh, these same people being recruited into Tyler's uh, little private army exactly. in which they go around doing anarchist deeds kind of in an attempt to show off how, show people how much they don't need the stuff in their lives by destroying things intentionally. Um, There's all these undertones of 
consumerism. Right. And they talk about, you know, how they're just being marketed to, how that's how that's the whole world is just all about buying things that they don't need and which is also the turning point for the narrator because up until this point he was totally digging what Tyler was doing and now he's starting to slowly get more and more concerned to the point where he's starting to panic because uh, what Tyler's doing is is straight up chaos and he, he could potentially be harming people and he's going around trying to solve the problem. Eventually he ends up chasing down and calling up all these different businesses. Sorry if I took over the narrative, but like uh, the, he starts calling up all these because he finds out that Tyler uh, is involved in, in grabbing, um, they're planning on destroying a bunch of uh, insurance buildings. So he ends up calling up all these buildings, but every single time he calls somebody up, he gets someone who is working for Tyler, right. you know, um, goes to a police station, finds the same thing. He eventually tries to get, uh, Elena Bonacarta's character out of there, Marla. Marla. He tries to get Marla out of the city. Um, they end up having a, uh, uh, something of a scrap of a fight at the end. Or, well, I, actually, before that point, Tyler ends up revealing, like, the big twist of the movie, which is... Right, yeah, so there's, there's, like, the way they built that up was really amazing. So throughout, throughout the movie, you're going to see these scenes um, where every time the narrator interacts with Marla, it's just this really ultra tense thing because Marla ends up getting in a relationship with Tyler and the narrator he just doesn't seem to care but it just doesn't seem to make sense it's always really tense what's going on he gets into a car accident intentionally Tyler intentionally drives the car off he gets into a car accident and he wakes up from this and just all of a sudden the entire like flow of the movie changes yeah and he sees how how big of a project Project Ma'am is. There's you know, dozens of people in the house and they're planning all these things. They're acting all uh, suspicious. They got all these things going on. He goes outside, he sees uh, Marla comes by and he just says, Tyler's not here. Yeah. And she just has this like crazy, what, what, and you know, it's just this really tense scene. Goes back in and uh, then that's when one of their friends is killed. Yeah. So he just he's flipping out from this because everybody in Project Mayhem is just acting. It's so much a cult, and he doesn't understand that. He can't accept it. He goes upstairs. He, he finds out that Tyler's been going behind his back, traveling to all these cities. It comes to a head when he's in a hotel. He calls up Marla, and he's, he, he himself is thinking, what is going on? And he starts asking Marla the difficult questions. And one of Tyler's rules was, don't ever talk to Marla about me. Yeah. And then so he just appears in his hotel room out of nowhere and eventually reveals to him the twist that he is Tyler. They are one and the same person. That insomnia, all the problems he's had all over this whole timeline has been him blacking out and doing all these things. It was him. Yeah. And, of course, he loses his mind and tries to undo everything. As you mentioned, he, right. starts, he goes to the police station and everywhere he goes, he finds that every person he interacts with has been pulled into this, is, is this part cult of, of is, Project Mayhem. Is part of the cult and, yeah. and uh, they, they won't let him stop it because they, they believe he doesn't want them to stop it and this is all part of his persona. Yeah. And uh, then it leads up to the, the ending, circling right back on the entrance. He's in this building, He's got the gun in his mouth and Tyler's there and then he realizes that he can control it. He takes the gun out of Tyler's hand just by thinking it's in his hand and he shoots himself in a way not to kill himself. Yeah. Uh, but he shoots himself right in the mouth and it ends up killing Tyler and not him. Yeah. And uh, he still doesn't have enough time to undo what Project Mayhem does and then the movie ends with all of the buildings just leveled. He ends up telling Marla, you met me at a weird time in my life. That is pretty much how the movie ends up ending. And then we cut to the Pixies. <laughs> Where was my mind? Yes. Um, <laughs> so do you, do you remember the first time you saw this movie? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I don't know if I could I mean, of course, I, I saw it probably uh, in the year 2000, right yeah. after it came to... You know, it's like nobody saw this in the theaters. It was, it was built completely incorrectly. It wasn't built towards... Like this sort of like a lot like the way David Fincher wanted to build this movie was like oh there's a philosophy to it and there's this wryness to it and it got billed as being like a fighting movie like that right. it was gonna be like uh, it, it was built to like re uh, WrestleMania fans and whatnot. It wasn't a boxing movie. That's no, for sure. it, it it was aimed at the a completely wrong crowd and they came in they watched it and they were just like this isn't what I was looking for you know. Um, 
but like, so you probably so, watched so, it. Yeah, yeah so I, I'm, I'm sure I watched it uh, on DVD or whatever right after that. Um, and the movie really like captured me. It was, I mean, it's, it's a really intense movie. Mm. So, um, yeah. It's been a while since that movie came out. You watched it more recently, obviously we both did. Mm -hmm. um, like, did, was there a lot that, that you uh, didn't remember? Was there things you didn't remember from the original movie? Or? So I kind of picked this movie because I've seen it a number of times. Right. And uh, I, like I said that in the beginning, that really the key to it is that I think there's so much depth in, in rewatching this movie. Yeah. So yeah, watching it again recently, it's probably been maybe two years since I've seen it last, okay. give, or, right. give or take. And uh, there was still that so much more depth that I, that I caught again watching it now. Because um, I don't think I've seen Fight Club for like something like 15 years or something like that. So, so much of this stuff was just lost to me. Obviously, there's the obvious scenes of like them counting down what the rules of Fight Club are in the <laughs> yeah. basement, which everybody knows. And like um, the, you know, I, remember, I knew what the twist was going into it, which was great because it gave me a chance to t look for the s scenes where like in that car accident scene, for example, the narrator steps into the car in the driver's side. When they get out of the accident, he comes out of the car from the driver's side. Um, and it's just like these little details that are in the movie, even though when David Fincher like made this movie, like he had stole in a, a stolen trick from the original book that uh, the Palinek wrote, he uh, keep their a level of homoeroticism as far as he's concerned okay. to throw the audience off into thinking that maybe this is about a relationship between our two characters and they were going That's to weird. find out life between themselves and to like throw them off that they're technically the same person. Uh, did you catch any of that, by the way? <laughs> um, well, I hadn't heard that, so I, so, <laughs> so I, I mean, you know, there was some some weird things. I think there was a scene where. Uh, Tyler's in the bathtub. He's in the bathtub, and yeah. the narrator's just like... And he's like, like clipping his nails or something? Yeah, and they're having like a heart-to-heart -heart while oh, they're about there. about their dads, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, like he, Tyler is constantly shown without his shirt, but like I think it's, it's lost on me. I never actually thought of it as being that way. And I don't know how many people actually would have thought of that uh, on their own without having the director actually say that he was intending to do it. Yeah. Um, but I can, I can say I can't remember like exactly when I realized where the twist was coming the first time I watched it. Right. But I, 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 I definitely remember, like, I didn't pick it up until it like, really started to becoming obvious. So whatever they did, I think, really worked. If, if you had never seen it, and hopefully you paused this show here before you <laughs> so like, got to see it without that. Sorry. <laughs> but um, when you haven't seen it, if you didn't know anything about that twist, I think the movie just develops really strongly. There's just so much... Um, tense moments to it that that do really kind of distract from the point that there is going to be this twist yeah we had uh there's one of the uh, early lines of this movie and suddenly i realized all of this the guns the bombs the revolution has got something to do with a girl named marla singer what the heck does marla have to do with this plot you know i remember that scene and i remember thinking this actually doesn't make sense um she was a, a really pivotal person in it but i don't think I really believe that scene the, of the movie to really be true, that, that phrase to really right. make sense. Well, I mean, this is the question is, is like, if you removed Marla from the plot, is she a necessary character? Does she hinge anything on this movie? Um, or is, like, is this really a movie about two people or is it a movie about three people? Well, Marla in the movie makes so many awesome scenes really happen. Right. And I think that without that character, a lot would be lost from the meat of the movie, but... I think it could have existed without her. I mean, it's possible that she had led to the catalyst of, you know, creating Tyler, so to speak, where, you know, she was distracting him from those support groups. But if you're kind of if you kind of read into a little bit of the timeline of the movie, it seems like Tyler existed from before the narrator starts. He talks about this insomnia, he talks about um, blacking out and waking up in an unknown place, it seemed like Tyler had really been there for quite a long time. Yeah, it seems like also like she's what the movie turns on when when the main narrator realizes that everything is going wrong because yes. he seeks out Marla and tries to protect her, um, which is a change in attitude that he has in the entire movie where he absolutely doesn't right. like her. Is there, is there any specific reason why there's that change or do you think it's just the way that the book needed to be written or... Um, well, that's a good question. He's definitely 
um, very, you know, iffy towards her. He doesn't really, doesn't, doesn't hate her, he doesn't like her, he's just indifferent towards her. Um, and I don't, I don't see a turning, what exactly a turning point was that made him actually realize that he cared for her. Yeah. Because that definitely becomes true on that turning point. And, um, but I, I don't actually see why. Yeah. Uh, more relevant question. Uh, are you a beautiful and uh, unique snowflake? <laughs> well, uh, if you're to believe anything that this movie was trying to tell you, definitely not. <laughs> see, uh, you know, Palahniuk was actually, uh, takes credit for actually the concept of people on the internet calling each other snowflakes. Um, Interesting. Yeah, no, because evidently it leads back to him. I think there's something to be said about the fact that, like, I think this is part of the, the problem, the reason why Tyler ends up breaking down is because um, if you take a look at the movie, Tyler is, uh, is looking at everything as being beautiful and unique, and he's not actually seeing that, like, things can actually be unique without being beautiful. Um, I've got... Uh, in my pocket, a one-star review. Oop, here we are. Because I figured uh, figured this was this was fun. But uh, the uh, worst underlying theme I have ever seen. The movie has bad subliminal messages throughout the whole movie. Basically, the movie is trying to dream people into being terrorists and and telling them telling uh, them to commit suicide. Go ahead, don't post this review. I know you won't because it's too negative, but remember this, woe to the man that stands in the way of Jesus. And then somebody responded to that, tell me about it, Jesus tried to get into a nightclub the other day and the bouncer was like, no sandals, man. <laughs> and he was severely woed. Um, but like a lot of people happen to have like this sort of negative response to Fight Club because they're like, oh, this movie's too violent. It promotes fascism, uh, stuff along those lines. It, what, how does this movie uh, survive itself despite these accusations? I think on the surface, the movie seems like a crass movie with a bunch of guys in a basement just brawling. But there is just so much depth to that. And I think that the people who watch it, who are able to get past that, that surface level, see that there is a lot of like actual true messages in the movie about how much consumerism has really taken hold in our society. And I think it's as much true today as it was in whatever, 1999 or 2000, whenever it was made. Yeah. I think it's definitely there. So I think that movie just really has a, a, a true message beneath it. Yeah. How they approach it, you know, creating a cult and, you know, creating chaos and, and it's, it's a lot over the top. Fincher himself did express the fact that, like, the movie is short on answers. It doesn't actually give you answers. It just no. gives you problems. And then it comes at them with what seems like answers, because Tyler's giving you uh, some very exciting responses to the way you should be living your life. But clearly, Tyler's way isn't the right way either. So it mostly just leaves you, uh, leaves you empty, by the way. Uh, like, how do you feel that the, the, the movie translates? It's been like 17 years. Do you feel the movie actually still seems modern? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think that it's harder to look at it in our our view of technology now. I mean, they use a payphone in the movie, so yeah, yeah. It, it seems maybe a little bit Dated. displaced. But I think the theme of it, I think uh, the the message is trying to tell, absolutely works today, just yeah. like it did then. I mean, it hasn't been that long. Strangely, the music still sounds fine. The music by the Dust Brothers, just like. Like the only time you actually notice the music was dated was when uh, Pixies come on at the end, and you're like, oh yeah, it's the '90s. <laughs> um, and also, like the special effects, the camera work, and the uh, the computer graphics. Considering the time period, this came out at the same period as like the Star Wars special editions, which looked great at the time. And nowadays, we look at them like, oh, some of that stuff doesn't quite look that well. Like a lot of those scenes come out looking pretty good. Um, but I'd just coming the peeling backwards from the garbage can, for example. The filming they did all overall really was exceptional. Yeah. And I think probably a good part of it is they just didn't weigh so heavily on the special effects. Yeah. And so I think that's that's an important element. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't a special effects movie, um, but they I think they did an amazing job with that and, and, and it still holds up. It looks like, I mean, maybe other than the payphone scene, yeah. it looks like a movie that <laughs> absolutely could have come out this year. Yeah. Well, that's unfortunately all that we have time for today. Um, we're going to be doing this uh, on a regular occasion. Check back with Popcorn Roulette. Uh, I also happen to have an audio drama by the name of Say Hello to Blackjack. You can find that at sayhellotoblackjack.com. And uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on, Tom. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Have a good day.